Moritz Cornelis Escher, better known as M.C. Escher, the inspiration of this tessellation art movement. His huge body of work inspired many artists. There are many books about his art. He is known not only for his tessellations, but for graphic art, landscape lithographs, woodcuts, complex impossible worlds. Escher snuck in some tessellations into his lithographs. I urge you to research him online if you're not familiar with his work. Most people recognize his art. It has made its way into popular culture quite extensively. In the past few years, there have been hundreds of museum and galleries showing his art. Interactive exhibits are popular these days. I will show you a sampling of his many accomplishments in drawing nested shapes. All of his 138 tessellations are in the symmetry section of the mcescher.com website, the official website. It's good to copy the masters. That's how some of us learn. Learning by doing. The trick is to go beyond copying. Ahead, sideways, any direction. Use the masters as inspiration for a new adventure, a stepping stone towards your own style. Go do a simple image search, M.C. Escher Tessellation. Images. You might be amazed at what you see. This Escher Reptile Tessellation is the first one I dissected with scissors and cardboard. That was during a class in the architecture department at Carleton U, the nature and behavior of materials. Professor Westwood was explaining crystal symmetry. The same rules that govern crystals also apply to tessellations. This was my introduction to drawing tessellations. My first fascination, my aha moment. I was copying the master M.C. Escher just like everyone else. I could draw it, but not necessarily understand it. That's why we are here in this class, to understand the how. M.C. Escher called this type of art, this obsession, regular division of the plane, and I quote, Filling two-dimensional planes has become a real mania to which I have become addicted and from which I sometimes find it hard to tear myself away. Some tessellation artists say that you should keep your figures and characters right side up for your audience. Hmm, this would limit the number of symmetry groups you could use drastically. Where's the fun in that? In my case, I aim to make you tilt your head while looking at these. Do somersaults, just like the little character wearing that bonnet. Rotation is one of the symmetry operations in this seashore topic, made up of three items from the beach. The combination is rotated around a four-way rotation point. Imagination is important for the inside of the shape, not only the outline. In Angels and Devils, M.C. Escher made good use of mirrors, another symmetry operation when it comes to tessellations and crystals. We see bilateral symmetry in the humanoid forms, a mirror right down the middle. This is the symmetry group we are studying in this class. The only difference is that M.C. Escher has stacked two figures along the mirror. They both still meet at the four-way rotation point in the middle. Another mirror-based tessellation. Four identical mirrors with a four-way rotation point in the middle. This is the symmetry group, the method we will learn in this first class. There are 17 ways to divide the surface or plane. If all goes well, there will be 17 of these classes. 
I will show you in the last video in this series how to do this Escher tessellation. Here, M.C. Escher uses glide reflections. This symmetry operation is a combination of a mirror, but with a shift occurring in the placement of its reflection. If you were to place a vertical line, just like on a carousel at the fair, the pole right through the horse's shoulders, in this case the mythical winged lion, that would be the glide line. And the reflection? The creature with a different color, at a different height, flipped in the mirror. Here's another example of a tessellation using glide reflections. There are only four symmetry operations in total for all tessellations. Translation, which is basically repetition. Reflection, as in a mirror. Rotation, around a central point. And what we've just spoken about, glide reflection. From 1938, this is a fish and bird tessellation by M.C. Escher. The tile is split into two figures, combined within the same tile. A simple repetition or translation of that combination tile, up, down, left, right. We can see that much thought was put into finding space for all the creature's appendages. Look at the wingtips nestled around a fin. The front of the wings is the curve of the tail fin. Absolute perfection of thought, of observation, of problem solving. Here, Escher has modified the bird and turned it into a sailboat. This is a great example of translation. Sailboat and fish. A bit different than the previous tessellation. The tile is a combination of the two elements and is repeated by translation. The outline is of most importance in a tessellation, with a good dose of imagination poured into that outline. The outline can always be tweaked and stretched, and it should. That's the fun part. What you remove from one side of the line will take its place on another side. It's always a give and take, a tussle for all available space. Here we see even more tweaking to both the outline and the inside of the tile, a refinement of the tessellation. I can only show you a few of his tessellations. There are too many. We can see here the three versions together, an evolving tessellation. I've outlined the tiles to show you the work Escher has done in tweaking the outline. The third image, the fish's mouth is now open and grabbing the sailboat's stern. The ship's prow, in the second instance, used to be the same height as the belly fin. But in the third version, it nestles the belly fin, the back fin, and the tip of the sail. Notice the sail is also much wider at the base. Minor changes with a big impact on the drawing. Escher's tessellations evolved from his study of the Islamic geometric designs. That's a whole field of study in itself. All this can give you an idea of the thought process behind the art form and all the work involved in creating, tweaking, and then printing tessellations, let alone a metamorphosis like this one from 1940. Now we have computer programs, apps, digital printers. We are somewhat spoiled today. All the hard work has been taken out, but there still remains the need for intuition, for imagination. That's the small spark of an idea that you should not discount. There's no substitute for that. In the next video, I will explain our first symmetry group to tackle.